Uh, well, I'm excited <laughs> to be with every one of you. I love Singles Devo. Uh, they didn't have these back when I was in singles. That's unfortunate. I mean, I'm in singles now, but like when I was legit okay. single, you know, they didn't have these. And so I'm so fired up to have these. Thank you so much, Rob. I love that passage because it talks about how youths can grow weary. I, and that, that encourages me. Uh, but it also says that those who hope in the Lord can renew their strength. So that's for us old guys too. And I'm just really fired up to be here. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I committed to studying out over the summer has been prayer. Um, I remember days. If you're from LA, you under, you know where El Dorado Park is. You're from the LBC. Yes, sir. Uh, El Dorado Park. I used to pray for hours before I would go to work or go on campus. Pray for I would literally follow the uh, sprinkler system at the public park, just praying and praying. And I and I had an epiphany this 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 a couple weeks ago, going, I want to get back to that. And so what I committed to doing this starting this week is studying out prayer. And so uh, I want to share with you, and it just so happened that uh, I had just, I don't, for those of you that know me, like look at my Facebook wall, all it is is I'm like resharing pictures and resharing quotes. That's it. I, I don't do anything else much on my Facebook page, but I happened to post something about prayer that I got out of my study on Monday. And on my way home from work, I get a call from Rob saying, hey, we were going to preach about prayer. Why don't you preach about prayer? And I'm like, hey, I love to preach. I love Come to on, preach. Bro. Um, Bridget. So I'm going to talk to you guys about prayer. And the title of my lesson tonight is Don't Block the Power. Not the power. Come on, bro. No, bro. So prayer uh, is no, the no. most important and the most powerful kingdom activity on earth. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 Many of you have heard me say this quote by John Wesley, and it goes a little something like this. It says, without God, we cannot. Without us, God will not. Uh, the, he started the, the uh, Methodist church, uh, which got some things right. Not everything right, but got some things right. And he, he, the, what he meant by this passage was that he saw that God had created the universe with a divine dependence that God will not work on earth without man and man cannot do any good work on earth without God. Genesis 1.26 says that the original intention of humanity was to rule and subdue, was to have dominion and authority over the earth. So God is woven literally in the fabric of creation that we have the authority on earth and that because of this, God has also decided to exercise his power through you and through me. Which means oh, that we can actually block the power of God on this earth. Amen. Yes, you and I can block the power of God, or we can loose the power oh, of God on, on the earth. Mm -hmm. Come on, bro. Deuteronomy 31, 17. Read Isaiah 59, verse 2. Read Psalm 66, Verse 16, read Proverbs 28, 9, and that's just a little taste of the scriptures that illustrate this point. Now, right. if that reality about your ability and my ability to either block or loose the power of God on earth doesn't change the prayer life, if it doesn't, it should, and if it doesn't, after this lesson, I pray that it does. Amen? Amen. Let's go, Eric. Oh, Come on, bro permission to exercise his influence and power on the earth. Isn't this what we're supposed to pray in Luke 11? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right, the prayer right. is necessary because the kingdom of heaven can't come to the earth without it. In Acts 2, what were the disciples doing constantly? They were in prayer, and then what happened? Bam, Pentecost happened. I don't think that's a coincidence, personally. Prayer is also the willingness for us to align ourselves with God to be vessels by which God gets his will done on earth. Let's bring this a little closer to home. This hit me pretty hard. When you look at Jesus clearing out the temple in Matthew 21, why did Jesus get angry? He got angry because among all the religious things that were going on, what he lacked, what he did not see, was the purpose of the temple, the purpose 
of his house, the purpose of the church, which is prayer. Wow. Come on, he did bro. not call the church to be a house of worship. He did not call the church to be a house of preaching. He did not call the church to be a house of service. The church was to be a house of prayer. As he right. it Amen. What is the building for? What is the temple for? It is for prayer. And guess what? Each and every one of us is the temple of God. So what does that mean? We should be houses of prayer as well. Amen? And let's go time. now this is convicting awesome. okay and, and i don't mean i don't don't read into this but let's just let's just have a conversation here as brothers and sisters amen uh -huh. think about how much time we spend in prayer in an average church service i'm not saying we're doing anything wrong so don't again read into what i'm saying but we might sing for 15 minutes and then have a three minute prayer and then we might preach and teach and have speakers for over an hour and then it, we close up the service with a three-minute prayer. Are we giving prayer the proper priority in our lives that it deserves? That's the question. Mm -hmm. Now, if this is the kind of priority that Jesus puts on corporate prayer, let's focus in on personal prayer. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. I appreciate you, bro. Rashad knows me really well. I am a hollerback preacher. Let's so, go! Back in the chat, holler back. Yeah, you want to holler back here? Yeah, Let's uh, go, bro. Nice. Come, on, bro. Here. Come on, bro. Come on, Eric. Let's go, for Chapter him. 11, check this out. It says in verse 1, One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Now, we're super familiar with this passage, many of us. But because of that familiarity, we can lose some of our ability to read it properly. Think about this. Prayer was the only thing the disciples asked Jesus to teach them. Wow. Interesting. Now, nowhere else in Scripture, at least that I could find, nowhere else in Scripture did the disciples ask Jesus to teach him anything. I mean, I mean, think about this. You've got Jesus hanging out with you on a regular basis, like every day. And you're watching him walk on water. You're watching him raise the dead. You're watching him heal lepers. You're watching him open the eyes of the blind. You're watching him cast out demons. You're watching him multiply food. Amen, brothers' households. Amen, Amen. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be smart of you to ask him to teach you to do some of those things? But there is not one single instance recorded of the disciples asking him to teach them those things. Wow. Come on, Eric. Now, let me permit you to do a little gut check tonight. Oh, help us out, bro. What would Ooh. you rather have Jesus teach you? Doing miracles or to pray? I think for many of us, the answer should disturb us deeply. Good question. I know it did for me. That's why I'm asking the question. Because earlier in the day, I'm like, I would much rather have a teacher that'll walk on water. That's way cooler than prayer. To my shame. Thank but you. Hey, this is why I'm preaching tonight. Amen. Amen. Bro. Amen, bro. Amen. While the Bible says that these guys were unschooled and ordinary, I actually think that they were pretty smart. Smarter than me, which doesn't take a whole lot, but uh, think about it. At some point, on, disciples must have figured out that prayer was the main thing. Turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. Let's go, bro. 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 11, but for now, let's turn to Mark 1. Preach it. Come on, bro. Mark 1, verse 35, everybody. Let the Spirit lead, bro. Man. Mark 1, 35, it says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let's go somewhere else, to a nearby village, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So we traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Now, this is just one instance of Jesus praying. And one that we use 
on a regular basis, especially for those of us who aren't morning people. This is something that we get discipled on a lot. Amen. But again, familiarity with the passage can leave us blind to some of the things that Jesus wants to teach us through his word. It says very early in the morning while it was still dark. Now, in the area around Palestine, during Jesus' day, the sun doesn't typically come up until about 5 o'clock in the morning. Still happens, but it's a little later now. But about 5 o'clock in the morning. But we see that he got up and left while it was still dark. Most scholars say that it was probably around 4 a.m. that he gets up and went out of the house. Then we observe that the disciples went to go look for him. Well, normally, back then, the markets didn't open up and life didn't start to move until around 7, 8 o'clock in the morning. It is around this time that the disciples woke up, realized Jesus wasn't around, and then went out to look for him. So let's do the math. Jesus was out of the house by 4 a.m., praying to God. When, in verse 37 hits, it's now 8 a.m. He has been spending the time with God for almost four hours. Wow. I find it interesting that Jesus' response is like, hey, let's go, as to say, okay, guys, I'm ready. Let's do this. And how many of us are annoyed at that brother or sister who wakes up early, has their quiet time, and is done and, like, fired up in the day, waking us up because they're ready to rock and roll? Come on, Steven. Let's Let's go. go. (laughs) Jesus was serious about his own personal prayer time. Write these down. Matthew 14, 32. Jesus got on a mountainside by himself to pray. Actually, Jesus prayed more often on mountains than he did anything else. Man after my own heart. Matthew 26, 36. We already know that passage. That's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He brings his disciples, tells them to stay right here. He grabs a smaller section of disciples, tell them to stay right here. And then he keeps going to get time by himself with his father. Luke 5, 16 says that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to pray. And then Luke 9, 18 says he was praying in a private place. You see the pattern here? Jesus had a habit of taking time away, away from people, to go pray, to get strength from God. The disciples, using inductive and deductive reasoning, which is why I think they're so smart, and logic, saw something powerful that if we have eyes to see, my brothers and sisters, can change our lives and the lives of those around us forever. Let's go back to Luke 11. Come on, bro. Back to Luke 11. Let's dig a little deeper. It's awesome, Eric. Come on, bro. Luke 11, back there in verse 1. Let's go, one Eric. Day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Now, notice there's a period between one day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and then it says, when he had finished one of his disciples. Now, what can we glean from this? Well, the disciples were observing him. They were there watching him. They were like, he's over here. They're like hiding behind a bush going, we got to see what this cat is up to. Where does it go? What does he do? They were taking notes. They saw him pray. They saw the power that came out of him after he had spent time with the father in prayer. And they deduced wait a second, this dude spends four hours in prayer, and yet when we meet a demon-possessed man, it takes him flat four seconds to cast the demon out. Come on, that's good, bro. The correlation hmm. here. Hmm. Come on, bro. Say that Jesus did the work from 4 to 8 a.m., and that the miracles were just a result of the work he had already done. Remember back in Mark 1, verse 39, said he went around, teaching in their synagogues, and driving out demons. That was the result of the work that he did in verse 37, which was very early in the morning. While it was still dark, he went out to go and pray. Jesus' time in the morning with the Father determined the outcome of his time with men during the day. If we're wanting Jesus' results, we need to do Jesus' work. And that work is done early in the morning by ourselves in prayer. Come on, bro. Every on, bro. one of you. Now, look at me. Look at me. Those of you, I want you to look at me right here. I'm, looking. Eye. I'm looking. Every on. single one of you on this Zoom call tonight are amazing disciples. 
The work that God is doing inside yeah. of each and every one of you is powerful and it's effective. Inspire me, bro. But, yeah. and That's I know true. most of you, I need this. You do this amazing work on 30 minutes of prayer on your way to work in the morning. Ooh. Ooh. It's about what God can Ooh. do in you with one hour of uninterrupted prayer, of two hours, of three hours, of four hours of uninterrupted prayer time. Yeah. Yeah. So get yeah. it strength from the Father. Come on, Stephen G. Come on, Come on Eric. On Teach I'm me to pray, bro. The disciples knew that they could learn to do the miracles. They could learn how to walk on water. They could learn how to drive out demons. They can perform miracles. They could memorize the first principle studies. They could preach a lesson that has some cool nuggets or some zingers. They could share their faith with a thousand people, serve the ministry with zeal. Are you getting the message? Yeah, but it would be up. worthless without the kind of prayers and the prayer life that Jesus had made and shown them that was perfect. Boom. That's true. Wow. Wow. Of us do such amazing things. We are servants. We're givers. We love people. We know how to sit the Bible with people. And we can preach great sermons, but we are blocking our own power because we care more about learning how to do the things that express the power of prayer than we do in learning how and are interested in learning how Jesus prays. Talk about that, bro. Mm. Let's go, Eric. Oh, bro. Asking an amen, you better say ouch. Oh. Mm. Mm. So what does this power produce? What is the outcome of this kind of prayer? It's a faith that produces great boldness. Boldness to go out and do great things for God. Not just preaching with boldness, but taking a stand at work. Asking for that raise being an example of hard work and dedication in your profession. Let's come in for a landing here, Luke 18. That's right, on, bro. for that raise. Come on, bro. Keep move going. Money. Move money. Come on, bro. Luke 18. We wasn't verse. ready. Luke 18 here, verse one, it says, then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a what certain you time, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, but because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This is a powerful scripture, and I hope you see what I'm seeing. Most times when Jesus tells us a parable, we don't get to see the purpose up front. But in this particular case, Jesus gives us the punchline ahead of the joke. The purpose was for us to see an example of perseverance and boldness in prayer. You got a judge who didn't uh -huh. love God and didn't care what people thought. This guy was hard as a rock, immovable, impenetrable. You could not shake him. Man. What about being someone who doesn't fear God and care what people think. That's a pretty powerful dude in this world, don't you think? Let's go, Jeremiah. Come on. Good or bad by God or by men. Now, who came to him? A widow. The lowest and most vulnerable type of person in the Lord's day was a widow. Here Jesus is pitting the most powerful man in the world with the weakest of weakest of people in the world. But listen to what he says in verse 7. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. Jesus said before that God is nothing like this judge. God is a loving father who wants to give good gifts to his children, as he says in Matthew 7, 11. Yet even the hardest of men can be worn down 
by the lowest and weakest of people with boldness, persistence, and faith. He says, keep praying, keep asking, keep knocking, and that door is going to open. But it won't just come to us sometime. At some point, he says it will come what? Quickly. Do you see that? He says, quickly. We will get justice quickly. That's this good, bro. Come on. That's God good. gives me what, I, what is owed to me. Let, me. let me say this. God will give me what is owed to me. This woman comes to this unjust judge and says, this is owed to me. This is the law. I need it. You give it to me now. Say it again, bro. Such Come on. Coolness that this woman had. Yeah. My goodness. To have the guts to stand up to this hardened judge and demand justice for herself. Wow. This is the power of prayer. Come on, this bro. This is the power of seeing that you alone are the one who blocks your power. Mm. You block it. Mm. Come on. Now, where does this block come from? It comes from a lack of faith that is really how prayer works. Let me say this again. This block comes from us not having faith that the way that Jesus just said it, how it works, is the way that it works. Why does he say, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? What does that have to do with persistence? What does that have to do with prayer? Jesus is asking, when he comes back, will he find people on this earth who actually believe what Jesus said right here? That God will bring justice and quickly. You know, we've had some pruning come on here to us in San Jose, yeah. in the professional Hello. industry here. And if I'm honest, guys, it's hurt me a lot. It's really uh, caused me to be discouraged and to get down and frankly to doubt the calling that God has on my life. But Ray Centenahi, one of my best friends, I had him do Bible talk a couple weeks ago. And he did Bible talk on John 15. Let's turn there. John 15. Go, bro. Come on. And, and while, he was, while he was doing this Bible talk, uh, uh, under the guise of like, I'm kind of going to participate, but I'm going to kind of like see how he does it because I'm, I'm, you know, giving him pointers and whatnot. I, I kind of... I, I kind of just had an epiphany and I, and I lost a, a little focus. And many of you have experienced this where uh, you're in a conversation, somebody says something and it just hits you. And all of a sudden, like everything around you fades away. And all you've got is just you and your brain. All you've got uh, is you, yeah. your heart, you and yourself are talking to one another. Yeah. Come on, bro. John 15 verse one says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So we know this passage again. Jesus says that God, the Father, is the gardener. He cuts off every branch that does not bear fruit and prunes the ones that do. Now, what's the purpose of the pruning? So that we will be even more fruitful. Cool. That's awesome. Awesome. Yay. But as Ray was leading the discussion, like I said, that grabbed my attention. And I kind of like went into the zone and I was like, this is what's happening. We're being pruned. You guys ever, I mean, am I the only one that's like having these conversations with myself every once in a while? No, bro. Uh, I'm like, oh, bro. I, I have this all the time. Oh, bro. Like, I'm like, what's happening to us? This, we're being pruned. We're not being cut off. We're being pruned. And we are being pruned to be even more fruitful. And I sat there with that for a minute. The next morning on my prayer walk, this is what I said to God. I said, God, you said that you would make us even more fruitful because we're being pruned. And I said, you better prove it. I said, God, you better prove that the scripture is correct. You better prove your word right. You say that we're going to be more fruitful because we've been pruned. We're being pruned. Make us more fruitful. Now, somebody might say, oh, dang, Eric, that is so arrogant. How dare you? Oh, that's bold. Oh, bro. That's bold as a lion. How dare you? Is mm. it? Or is it just as arrogant as the lowly widow demanding justice 
for herself before an unjust judge. I say it's not arrogance, but it is my legal right under the law of God to say, hey, God, this is what you said. Make it true. Yeah. In Moses's prayers, look at Abraham's prayers, look on, at bro. David's prayers. They're full of God. You said this. Now do bro. this. God, you said this was going to happen, but you also said this was going to happen. We're humbling ourselves. Prove that you're still with us. Make me fruitful. The bold prayers of men and women who have power because they see their need to be taught by Jesus how to pray. That's boldness. Mm. Bro. But let me ask you. Let me ask you. When Jesus comes back, Will he, as he looks down and sees the disciples in the Sacramento City International Christian Church, will he find faith there it is. on the earth? When he looks down and sees the disciples in Berkeley, will he find faith in your part of the earth? Let's Dude, go, bro. Come on, San bro. Francisco, in Silicon Valley, will he find Let's faith go. in your part of the earth? Come on, bro. Yes, he will. Mm. Hey, in San Jose. Let's go. <laughs> And the faith that brings Come on. prayers of men and women who demand that he do what he's promised to do. Will oh, he that? Hey. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. I believe that he does. And I believe that he will. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come, Come on, bro. bro. Sisters, and I pray that you see the significant role that prayer needs to have in your life much differently as a result of the passages we've looked at tonight. I pray that you see the amazing power that your personal prayer times with God can have in your life and the lives of those around you. I pray that you don't block the power and put mm. prayer as the number one most important thing that you can do for the kingdom and to pray as if it depends all on God, which it does, and then to get to work as if it depends all on you, which it also does. Family, mm. let's be powerful men and women of prayer. Mm. I love you very much. Come on, bro. Oh, this is awesome, bro. Oh, that was awesome. Come on. Bro. Bro. Be awesome, bro. Y'all, Thank you so much, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro.